Hello, good evening, and welcome to Fracking Nightmare. Now, tonight, there is a very much an international flavour to our show, and uh, we will be bringing in guests from live from the Bentley blockade in New South Wales, and also speaking to Vera Scroggins, who I have described as the scourge of the Pennsylvanian gas industry. Vera currently has uh, an injunction preventing her from entering something like 300 odd square miles of Pennsylvania um, due to her being a bit of an irritant to Cabot Oil. So I think we could pretty much guarantee that Vera is doing something right. So that's going to uh, kick off in part two. But before we get into the uh, uh, scene in Australia and in the US, Let's have a bit of a roundup on what's occurred over the past week in the UK, because it's been a seminal week in many respects. Last week, I talked about uh, this gentleman known as Kate, and I th mentioned that Kate was going to be appearing in court the, uh, on the Tuesday after last week's show. And Kate is, uh, I think, top of the league table in terms of the number of arrests at Balkan. Very much on point as uh, uh, an activist of direct action, uh, involved in at least four, or maybe even five lock-ons, and uh, was also arrested a further, on a further three occasions, uh, basically to get his bail conditions lifted because the general modus operandi of the Greater Manchester Police was to um, release people that they'd arrested after participating in a lock-on uh, with um, somewhat punitive bail conditions, preventing them from returning to Barton Moss Road. Yet, if they were re-arrested, then the police had to pull them before the magistrate, and in pretty much every case, the magistrates immediately lifted the bail conditions, much to the chagrin, of course, of the Greater Manchester Police. But the judiciary were upholding the fundamental right to peaceful protest. So Kate, I think, had something uh, in the region of about eight arrests under his belt uh, during the, uh, the Barton Moss campaign, and um, ha had uh, voluntarily gone to the uh, Swinton police station to report as part of his bail conditions, but was actually then remanded. And so he was on remand last week when I made mention of the fact that his case was going to be heard the following day. And to everyone's absolute shock, the judge ruled that Kate should remain on remand for a further six months with a trial date set for October. So what we have is a literally an outrageous situation. You'll see this is one of the lock-ons in which um, uh, Kate participated. And that's actually Kate with his uh, back to us there. So there was no sign, no intent of anything other than peaceful protest at Barton Moss. So Kate is clearly being used as an example. So he is fundamentally, as described by his uh, solicitor, a political prisoner, a political prisoner. You know, there, are, there are people who have committed much more heinous crimes who have gone on to uh, bail or just been tagged. But in this case, Kate is on remand. So if you feel that this is an injustice, then please write to the Greater Manchester Police, write to perhaps your MP, or write to Kate himself, care of Winston Green Prison. Now, I don't think uh, anyone would wish uh, any jail time on any activist, particularly an activist that has effectively committed themselves and their lives to the protection of this community. And the UK is still fundamentally frack free. There's only been one well drilled and fracked in this country, and that is the well at Priest Hall, which was drilled and fracked in early 2011. Now, this is going to be uh, an uphill battle, and that's why it's so important that we take account of the experiences of the people in Australia. The people in New South Wales are certainly learning from the experience of uh, their neighbours uh, just across the border in Queensland, where some five and a half thousand wells have been drilled in the last six years. 
And of course, even ahead of Queensland is Pennsylvania, um, where they've been subjected to this abomination for best part of the last decade. And uh, Vera will be updating us on uh, what's occurring in Pennsylvania. But here in the, in the UK, also last Tuesday, there was the West Sussex County Council um, planning committee hearing regarding Quadrilla's planning application to return to Balkum to run an acid frack. Oh, sorry, they call it an acid etch. They want to effectively pump 10,000 gallons of hydrochloric acid into the well that uh, was drilled at um, uh, Balkum, and they want to run a flow test. Well, needless to say, the residents of Balkum are not too impressed, and they put up what was a truly remarkable uh, case. But um, despite the fact that there were almost 900 objections to Quadrilla being granted permission to return to Borkham, and literally just a handful of uh, uh, people in favour of their return, the planning committee effectively rubber-stamped the planning application. Well, this should really come as no surprise because anyone who is still under the illusion that their elected representatives are actually in position to represent the interests of the people that elected them, unfortunately, that would be a delusion. Once these people get into their office, then they are effectively there to maintain the charade of democracy. They are simply there to create the impression that the population have an input into the discussion. In reality, they are there to facilitate the agenda of the corporations. And there was only one West Sussex uh, councillor who voted against the planning application. So one Sussex County councillor remaining in integrity while the rest effectively prostitute themselves to the corporations. A similar situation up in East Yorkshire, where Rathlin have been granted planning permission to also run to acid fracks. Oh, sorry, acid etches. But in East Yorkshire, the uh, potency of the etching is going to be 50% greater than that of Balkham. So in, uh, in um, East Yorkshire, Rathlin are looking to pump their uh, uh, hydrochloric acid mix at 15% uh, of the solution, whereas uh, Quadrilla are looking at 10%. Uh, Either way, this is simply a first foothold. Don't think for one minute that the unconventional gas industry is going to stop at a simple acid etch. Once they establish the magnitude or the potential magnitude of the flow, they will present a case that says there's an enormous amount of gas there, but we can't extract it just with an acid etch. We need to frack. And the fact that they are investing significant capital into this process means that they have effectively been told, don't worry, we'll get through all of the red tape, we'll make sure that you get the opportunity to go into full production. But let's just do it in baby steps. We'll start off with a 10 or 15% dilution acid etch, and then we'll push for a full-blown frack. This is exactly what has occurred elsewhere in the world. It's uh, the process of gradualism. And as I've said in many occasions, this industry, like any other industry, works on the basis that it's a lot easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. Meanwhile, the Barton Moss Camp, which has effectively um, taken its leave for the summer, and uh, as promised, the camp has been removed. Now the onus is on iGas to live up to their promise to the local residents to remove the outrageous fencing topped by razor wire that is the eyesore at the edge of the M62 on Barton Moss. But forgive me, don't hold your breath, residents, because the likelihood of iGas adhering to that promise is slim to none. No doubt that that uh, defensive fencing, defensive against what we ask, but no doubt it'll still be there when iGas return later this year to run their flow tests. 
Well, the people that were at uh, uh, Barton Moss are currently taking a well-earned respite at Upton in Cheshire, where they have effectively occupied the site that Dart Energy planned to drill a mile or so away from Chester Zoo. What this is also doing is it's creating the opportunity for the, uh, the camp to educate the local population, because ultimately, as we're going to hear, the onus on preventing this abomination coming into your backyard is going to rest with the local population. Now, this is presented as a novel industry, but there is nothing novel about this industry. It's been running for almost two decades in the US. And today, when we speak to Dan Schreiber in Bentley and Vera Scroggins in Pennsylvania, and we listen to the experiences that they have had and are having in their respective countries, don't think for one moment that that won't be exactly the same here. In fact, the geology of the UK is far worse. We have a much more heavily faulted geology in this densely populated island than exists in either uh, Eastern Australia or in anywhere in the US. The major forts in the US, obviously, the San Andreas Fault and the New Madrid Fault, but with that exception, the rest of the US is, from a tectonic point of view, fairly stable. In the UK, the faulting here is horrendous and provides the ideal pathway for the migration of the frac fluids to breach into the aquifers. At the moment, we're at the first hurdle here. Unfortunately, in uh, Australia and in the US, they're a long way into the race. But the people of those countries haven't given up. They're not resting on their laurels. They're not accepting that the industry has uh, established a firm foothold. There is a determination to shut it down. And in reality, as I discussed previously, the farce that is occurring in the Crimea and the UK, Ukraine right now is partially manipulated to demonize Russia, to force the EU into introducing sanctions to prevent Russia from exporting its gas into Eastern Europe. And who should ride to the rescue? The US, exporting their surplus of unconventional gas. Of course, this would lift the prices of gas in the US, but the companies that have invested in this industry now want to maximize that investment. And the way in which they plan to do that is by exporting the shale gas to the EU. We have to stop this in its tracks. Watch what's happening in your area. We need people all across the country. There's, I think, about 174 anti-fracking groups that uh, we know of in the UK. It's the fastest growing, I'll use the word loosely, environmental movement. It's a lot more than environmental. This movement crosses the entire social, political, and philosophical spectrum. It's pulling people together who may previously have never even considered that they were batting for the same team. It's imperative that people recognize the significance of this industry and the damage that it will reap right across the landscape of the UK. We're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, we're gonna be talking to Dan Schreiber in Bentley, New South Wales, and Vera Scroggins in Pennsylvania, uh, North America. Introducing the magazine for free thinkers. 100 pages of high quality color print. Packed with information the mainstream media will never tell you. Published quarterly covering a range of subjects including politics, history, science and technology. Uncensored magazine. Think for yourself. Back issues also available on CD-ROM in PDF format. To subscribe, visit worldwideweb.uncensoredmag.co.uk or call us on 0207 558 
8869. And welcome back to part two of Fracking Nightmare. Now, I have on the line Vera Scroggins from um, Pennsylvania. So, uh, Vera, can you hear me? Yeah, hi there. Hi, Dan. Hi. Hey, welcome. Oh, an excellent picture. Oh, thank you. Must be some good technology links between here and uh, the US. Now, am I right? You are in Pennsylvania or you are south of the border in New York? I am south of the border in New York, and that's also Pennsylvania. That's uh, both. <laughs> Go on, explain that one to me. Well, I'm south of the border of New York because Pennsylvania touches part of New York, like the upper part of New York. So, like, I drive into New York every day. I'm in New York right now. And this is the upstate New York, upper part of New York. Right, right. It's not New York City. No, I appreciate that. Okay, so you're literally uh, straddling, pretty much straddling the border of New York and Pennsylvania. Now, yes. if I bring the, this map up onto the screen here, uh -huh. um, there we, what we're looking at there is the shale gas plays in the US. And, of course, that uh, very large shale play over in the northeast there, the Marcellus Shale, um, that's your particular area of interest, correct? Yes. And yeah. you, you're pretty much located right somewhere in the slap bang in the middle of that, I'm guessing. No, all the way to the north, to the corner, the eastern corner. Keep yeah, a little bit to the left. Go, go left. Go left here. Yeah. Go left. Go right. Right, 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 right. Right, just there. Okay. And, little, and below that that line. I'm just below that line. Okay. Okay, so now, now I understand that you have effectively got court orders um, which have been brought about by Cabot Oil uh, preventing you from entering large tracts of Pennsylvania. Well, uh, that was the original court order in October of last year where they said I was denied access to any part of Cabot leased properties or owned properties. So anything that they've leased the mineral rights in our county or anywhere, I was denied access. That was in October. And so that happened for about uh, five months. And then I, during that time, I acquired three lawyers who are pro bono, which means they're offering their services. And they're very concerned about the civil rights violations that I'm incurring as a citizen, as an American citizen. And so they came on board and they wanted to uh, fight this battle with me, which is wonderful. Otherwise, I would be on my own because that's how I was in the beginning, that my first court date in October, I was on my own and I had to endure um, four hours of a hearing and represent myself and also question all the witnesses that Cabot brought in and uh, speak for myself and that of course I'm not a professional and I never did that before but I but what everybody tells me I did a good job considering so, but you must have you must have done something absolutely horrendous to uh, bring about the wrath of Cabot to uh, bring this injunction upon you it must be uh, horrendous because I would I would be embarrassed if I was Cabot they should be embarrassed I mean can you imagine a multinational multi-billion dollar company going after one a uh, senior citizen woman, Granny, who's only like five feet one, and going after her with a battery of attorneys and all kinds of money spent to try and keep her away from the sites. So that's uh, pretty odd already. So that has given Cabot all kinds of negative, bad publicity worldwide. Because why would you even do that? Can't you, like, do something else if you want to keep this Granny away? But why do they so want to keep you away? Because I've been uh, documenting their sites and their activities besides everybody else in my county. Cabot is only one of six gas companies. And I've been documenting with over 600 videos in about five years and hundreds of photographs besides testimony, all kinds of phone calls to every uh, regulatory agency you can imagine in our country and telling them about what's happening to us and showing them the documentation, and then they've been uh, violated a number of times, and they've gotten already, not just because of me, but because of our regulatory agencies who inspect them, over 550 DEP, the D Department of Environmental Protection, 
uh, violations just for Cabot alone in our county, which is only one county of about 40 counties in Pennsylvania. And that's only in five years and millions in fines. So I also do citizen tours. I do uh, what I call citizen guest tours. And I bring celebrities and and legislators and people from all over the world and farmers and citizens and show them what is happening next to our homes, on our school properties, on our farms. And when people see it, most of them, like 98% of them, are horrified. And they say, this is absolutely unacceptable. We do not want this in our neighborhoods. This is not at all what we imagined or what we were told. Tavira, have Cabot actually challenged the veracity of uh, the information that you've been putting out uh, because I mean obviously if they challenge the content then that's one aspect or are they simply just seeking to ban you because you're, you're uh, considered a nuisance? No they never challenged the veracity which is interesting they basically said in their paperwork that I am a danger I am a danger to their workers I have done irreparable damage and I'm a danger to myself I'm a danger to the people that I bring. So that, and plus then they have a whole list of instances where they claim I have trespassed on their sacred land that they have leased from other landowners. And for them, anything is a trespass, like walking up to the sign. There's a sign maybe 20 feet from the road. Walk up to the sign, you're trespassing. Oh, and then they have their little security shacks. They might be, uh, let's say, 100 feet from the road. And you, normally people drive up to a security shack and ask questions, ask to be let in, ask to talk to someone. They consider that a trespass. So most of my work, 90% or more, is done right from the road. And I've also been welcomed at other times by the drilling companies before Cabot had security shacks, which they instituted two years ago, because I've been doing this since five years ago. They would welcome me on there and I would go on there because they had signs and they said visitors report to the uh, supervisor, the site supervisor. And I would go there, go to his trailer and ask questions and bring people with me. And they were very obliging and friendly. And I did that for about three years. So that's what they consider trespassing. But basically, it's just a ruse, just basically to cover up what they don't want to be seen, because I show everything that Cabot does not show in their nice little sanitized polite and safe, so-called safe tours. I've been on two of their tours and they show everything is, when they show everything, they just say, listen, everybody see how nicely we do everything. We, we do all according to regulations. We cover all the bases. There's nothing for you to worry about. We are such good neighbors and we don't want to hurt anybody and we will be an asset to your community. So let me just go back on to uh, the definition of danger. How do they define that you are a danger to their workers, uh, to yourself, and to those people that you bring on tour? Well, what I find interesting is they'll say, well, you know, you're coming, if you come on our sites, which I rarely do unless I have permission, if you come on our sites, you are distracting the workers. And that can be a danger because if they get distracted, they might actually do something wrong. They might get hurt or they might mess up the operations. And while you're on the site, something could happen. There could be a natural occurrence, you know, a little accident or maybe a big accident. And you could get hurt and the people you bring with you can get hurt. So that's their definition from what I understand so far of danger. And they don't realize that they are the danger. Who has all the violations? 550 so far. Who has the millions in fines? Who is the danger here? They're in our community. I live there. So I'm the danger. Senior citizen granny, five foot one, is the danger. I mean, that is, uh, I would be embarrassed to say that. I, their PR people should really get special lessons on how to do international PR because they just messed up their PR by coming after this lady. Well, ab absolutely. And um, trespass. Uh, I mean, in the in the UK, we have two, or uh, well, at least two levels of trespass. There's trespass and aggravated trespass. And uh, if there is just trespass, then ostensibly it's a civil offence and one that the, the police really can't get involved in. Um, in fact, the landowner has to go through the civil courts to get an injunction to remove you. But uh, in the US, 
Um, I think it differs from state to state. But if you are considered to be trespassing, can the company then literally call the, uh, the local uh, law enforcement and uh, get you removed? Sure. I could have done that. Five years I've been doing this. They know I've been doing it openly. I've talked to them. I visit their uh, corporate headquarters there. Uh, they know who I am. They know where I live. They could have just called the police and filed a complaint. And they could have filed a criminal complaint, a civil complaint. They could have gone to our district attorney. And they never did that. They let me just do this for five years. And then they decided they had enough. And then they went straight for an injunction, and the injunction was such that they wanted to make sure either somehow to intimidate me, scare me, scare everybody else and intimidate them, because if they do it to me, they're going to do it to somebody else, and to say that I have to have this blanket special type of restriction. And I said to my lawyers, I don't want any special restrictions. I'm an American citizen. I just want to have any restriction like anybody else. I don't want to have any buffers. Because when they did the second, uh, in March, the second order, because then my attorneys went back and filed an appeal to the first order, then now we have a second order, a temporary one, and now they've settled on, for now, just a uh, 100-foot buffer around all of their sites, all of their gas sites. I have to stay beyond that, beyond that 100-foot buffer and the entrance to their sites, all their access roads. I must stay 100 feet away from that. Sounds and like so, you just need a, a bigger lens for your camera, really. Yes, well, I got a bigger lens, <laughs> but still do not want any kind of restrictions like that. Of course. All I need to do is have a no trespassing sign, which they never did until after the first court order in October. Then they got a no trespassing sign, and they plastered it on all their sites. All you got to do is have that. If I cross that little nice little sacred line of yours, then you call your police or you call the courts and you file a charge just like anybody else does in the United States. They don't do injunctions like this. So well, this is the strange thing about it. Well, they're obviously, uh, you're obviously doing something very right. And, uh, you know, it, it's thanks to uh, the efforts of yourself and others, of course, that uh, people elsewhere in the world are waking up to this abomination. And uh, right now we, we do have Dan Schreiber on the line, live from Bentley. Now, uh, it, it's, uh, we've literally, we're straddling the globe here. I think it's about seven o'clock in the, in the morning. That's tomorrow morning, uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, in in Bentley, um, and I think it's about four o'clock in the afternoon on Monday in Pennsylvania. So we are straddling the globe. So Dan, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, Ian. How are you going? Good, good. Hopefully, you've uh, found a location where you got a good signal. Can we see some video, perhaps? There we go. Hi so, there, Dan. Uh, we, we... Yeah, yep. So behind me, you can see the Bentley. Yes. Yeah, it's breaking up um, a, a, a tad. Yeah. The video looks like a bit delayed, but I'm not sure if you can get the audio. Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, we'll talk. Well, what's, what can we see behind you? Uh, behind me is probably about uh, an 800 strong um, posse. Uh, the, bent, the Bentley Brigade, you could call them. And they sing um, every, every door. And there's a, a morning ceremony and a morning get-together and a song. And then I'll swing around and you could see the sunrise over the Bentley camp, which is down there. So how many people uh, would you say are actually gathered at Bentley right now? Um, I'd, I'd guess about eight, six to 800. Now, we, we've heard figures reported of like two to three thousand. That's correct. Yes. So, you know, this has been going on for, I'm, I'm here with uh, Mike New and he's been on the ground for pretty much the whole time. How long has it been going on, Mike? It's been going on for about three months now, guys. Um, you know, anywhere there's a minimum of two to three hundred people in camp and on the gates and on vigil. Probably, you know, three times that amount of people in the community around here supporting them and on peak days when we ask people to come in where we have intelligence telling us that there is police action about to happen we have two to three thousand people on site 
So, I mean, this, we've, we've really reached a stage where this is the people versus the corporations. And, um, and of course, I mean, as you well know, uh, the government is very much in the pockets of the corporations. So uh, you are absolutely on the front line there in, uh, in Australia right now. Yeah, look, um, I think there's a, a solidarity. It seems like, you know, there, there was um, a whole bunch of protests last year, you know, rolling on from from Middle East Springs all the way through Occupy movements. And, you know, I think when it comes to, to locking into the actual land, you know, when we're protecting resources, the Northern Rivers region is particularly vocal and... You know, I think this is definitely a last stand. Yeah, because Queensland has, has had some about five and a half thousand wells drilled, particularly in um, in southern Queensland. And the reason that's of particular interest to us is that the area that's been you know, drilled uh, extensively is about the size of the UK. And, and God forbid, I mean, if, if ever we are um, uh, attacked by uh, that kind of drilling activity, then it's pretty much the end of, uh, of the UK as we know it. It'll become uninhabitable. But uh, obviously there's a lot of people that have come across the border uh, from Queensland into New South Wales. So how many wells have actually been drilled and fracked in New South Wales to date? Um, I think there's there not that many. Um, what happened, Glenugi? Glenugi and Doubtful Creek. We've been really lucky in New South Wales that uh, you know Queensland led the way. The New South Wales government was slow at um, taking this industry up. So we've had a two, three, four year head start to prepare and see what's happened in Queensland. There's only been the order of ten wells or so drilled around this area. The EPA, our Environmental Protection Agency, just released a report. The, of one of the wells just maybe um, 20, 30 kilometres from where we're standing um, damaged two aquifers and released uranium into the water at 20 times the level of uh, safe drinking. So, you know, we're, we're now getting scientific reports linking, linking unconventional gas mining to damage to aquifers um, in, in very serious ways. Um, you know, the, the, the other interesting thing here is we've been blessed with is that uh, we've had a lot of warning. This is the, where we're standing now is the tip of a four to five year campaign of ground swell led by groups like Lock the Gate, like Gasfields Free, Northern Rivers. Um, and it's all coalescing and catalyzing onto this one site here at, at Bentley where, where we are drawing a line in the sand. Yeah, and we're expecting about uh, 700 white lease next week. And one of the factoids I found out this morning is that um, there's 54% of Australia is already under gas field uh, exploration license. 54%. That's that's enormous. I mean, that, that's uh, I mean the um, Australia is about uh, 50 times the size of the UK. Um, so you, you're talking an area yeah, yeah. about 20 to 25 times the size of the UK already under gas licence. Yes. And, um, well, that, that is absolutely horrendous. I mean, I know that uh, Queensland ha has borne the brunt over the last uh, few years. And, uh, uh, of course, um, you know, you guys have the advantage, if you like, of the Queensland experience. So let me ask you the question. With the very, very obvious uh, contamination in Queensland, and of course the likes of Brian Monk has been instrumental in raising awareness of the plight of the southern Queensland farmers, how is it that the politicians, the elected representatives of uh, the people of New South Wales, because you have the state government as well as the federal government, how is it that your elected uh, politicians are able to simply ignore the experience of your neighbours in Queensland? Yeah, good question. I mean, that's the, the question on most people's lips, and especially with the current uh, our government, they seem to be running roughshod over uh, the people up in our area. I think there's 87 percent uh, has been polled, and this is actual door to door. I does not want this gas. Uh, mining, yes, they're going ahead against the will of the people, which is unconstitutional, unlawful, 
and downright latest mood. There's, there's been a very interesting um, movement recently in at the New South Wales government level. We have an independent crimes commission against corruption. Um, in the last three weeks, that brought down the Premier of the state. He had to resign. It brought down the Mining and Resources Minister. He had to resign. Three days ago, the police minister had to resign. Um, two years ago, the guy that approved a lot of mining licences had to resign because he was shown to be taking corrupt bribes from mining companies, I believe. Um, the mining companies have been very savvy in the way over the last several decades that they've infiltrated um, Australian politics, that they've supported the parties, and that they've set up a uh, legislative landscape that is uh, um, supportive of their actions, often under the guise of environmental protection. Yeah. Here we stand in 2014, and the, uh, the cat is out of the bag, and we clearly see what's going on. So Australia has a really, um, you know, a big challenge to um, to clean that up and to allow politics to stand on its own rather than be controlled by mining corporations. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. Australia um, should be the wealthiest nation on the planet, you know, in terms of uh, the the breadth and depth of resources, natural resources. Um, but the reality is, of course, that the corporations have effectively taken control of Australia and the wealth is not being passed to the people, which is why Australians have the highest level of personal debt of any developed nation on the planet. This is correct. <laughs> um, well, as you know, Ian, like, um, that, that's the personal problem of the people, but if, if the bank collapse it'll, collapse, it'll be the bank's problems, won't it? <laughs> well, you know, this is the, the problem of having a central bank and a debt-based economy, and um, I'm sure that uh, we're, on the, we're, we're of one accord when we say that uh, the sooner that that uh, does collapse, then the, uh, the sooner we get an opportunity to, to do it right. Yep, look, um, from, from what's going on, it's, it's becoming more and more obvious that there's a, I guess a, a last-minute dash for resources. Um, there's, there's an obvious uh, movement here to grab whatever can be grabbed by the corporations. It's becoming more and more obvious that uh, the police, as well as uh, the politicians, are in the pockets of the, the big corporations who are basically raping and pillaging the landscape as they have for the last couple of Yeah, and we, we are seeing exactly the same in the UK. Unfortunately, um, it, it's not yet well advanced. Um, the British government is desperate to try to advance the agenda. But uh, now let me go back to, uh, to Vera because, you know, we see some very different tactics here. Uh, Vera, did you have uh, mass blockades uh, when the industry started to move into Pennsylvania? No, nothing at all, nothing at all because we were not warned by anybody. Uh, we were not told anything until the first rigs appeared on the farms on two farms in our county and in other counties and all of a sudden a rig appears and you don't know what to do with it and I knew that it was trouble, it meant trouble and so I started documenting at that point and taping and photographing and inquiring and learning as much as I could because I knew nothing at that point and most of us knew nothing so we were not warned and our government didn't warn us and they just let them in quietly. So the, there was no warning from the Western states. I mean, obviously, this, you know, the, the tight gas industry has been around, I mean, from my days in, uh, in the US in the mid-90s, uh, when it was uh, certainly embryonic. But uh, in um, you know, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, uh, West Texas, and nobody from those states came into Pennsylvania to, to warn the population of Pennsylvania what they were about to endure? No, nothing at all, zero. And so when we finally started to see what was happening, and as we got into it, I was hoping it would end, but since it didn't end, then we started to warn everybody and let people know. And we started to warn New York and the other surrounding states like Maryland and Delaware and Illinois and New Jersey, all the states surrounding us, and we've been warning them since then. And that's why basically they are closed to the industry. And they're very wary of letting the industry in and all of our waste. Our waste is still going into some of these states. 
and they need to stop and they have bills that are pending to keep that our Marcellus waste out at some point. Because New York has a moratorium on um, uh, hydraulic fracturing at the moment, but New York still has a massive problem because a, uh, I think um, the vast majority of New York State actually uh, gets its fresh water from Pennsylvania. No, no, they don't get, they have their own uh, reservoirs. New York City has a reservoir in upstate New York, and they have other reservoirs, and they're large ones, and other parts of the state have reservoirs where they get their water. So they're getting it from their own state, from New York. They do not get anything. What they do get is our dirty Marcellus waste uh, to their landfills. Uh, that's what they're getting from us, but not any clean water. So the, with the with the landfill, how is it that uh, the New York State Legislature have permitted the uh, import, effectively, of, of the waste? Because they've imported waste from us before, before even Marcellus, and so this was just as if it was additional waste, and then, then there has to be a protest about it. They haven't stopped it. Now they have more people protesting in New York. And they're showing that it's radioactive besides having heavy metals in it and other undesirable qualities. So now when some of the legislators came in, we showed them what's in the waste and we showed them how many millions of gallons and, and millions of tons of waste there is. And we let them know this and now, now they're alarmed about it. But they've only been alarmed about it for the past two years or so. And they're trying to stop it. So we've always had this freedom to bring waste between the different states from state to state so that's that's what we need to stop at this point it's always been that way okay we're okay. going to take a short break and then we'll be back with vera scroggins in pennsylvania and dan schreiber in bentley new south wales If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337-531 to order your copy now. And welcome back to part three of Fracking Nightmare. And with me tonight is Vera Scroggins in Pennsylvania and Dan Schreiber in Bentley, New South Wales. Can we go back to Dan? Dan, are you uh, still online? Hello, Dan. No, nope, Dan seems to have disappeared for the moment. So, Vera, let's go back to Vera. What I'd like to say to you, our country is basically the same, where they talk about a debt-ridden debt country. We have a country the same way, and we have people who are basically debt-ridden. And uh, the banks are holding tremendous amount of debt over our heads. And eventually, hopefully, we have also a, 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 a one bank, you know, that's over everything, the Reserve Bank. Uh, and it's uh, something that needs to come down. So I found it interesting that whatever he described in Australia or New South Wales was similar to our country. Well, it was tried first in America, and that's why you're 17.2 trillion in debt. Um, yes. And uh, effectively, uh, I mean, tragically, the, the U.S. is effectively in total hock, of course, to the, uh, the global banksters. Um, you know, and yeah, it is a horrendous situation, and especially when one takes into account that uh, when um, uh, George W. Bush took office, the level of debt was just a little over two trillion, and and so in the space of thirteen years, it's gone from two trillion to seventeen point two trillion, and and of course this is totally contrived, um, and the purpose is to totally subjugate the the U.S. citizen. And as we are seeing more and more, um, and obviously a classic example of this is in West Texas, uh, where the citizen is effectively uh, totally subjugated to the corporations because in any legal situation, the corporation always takes precedent over the rights of the individual. Except that we did have recently, maybe you might have seen it, 
a court decision just happened about two weeks ago where a family uh, sued the Range, uh, I forgot the name of the company, I think it was Range maybe. Um, this oil is the Car company. Family in Texas. Yeah, the Car Family, and they had just received a $3 million settlement. Of course, it will probably be appealed. But this is happening now in Texas. People are protesting in Texas where all of this has originated. And there's other towns in Texas, like Denton, Texas, where people are trying to get the citizens want to have a ban and to stop all this awful fracking and drilling, which is affecting the environment there, as well as here, where I am, and other parts of the, of the country. It's affecting our water, our air, our health. And this is all near homes, near schools, uh, on farms, and this is all over our country. We have th over 30 states that are involved. Well, and it needs to stop, and now more and more people are protesting. Well, it's, in it's interesting, Vera, that uh, Dallas the, and Fort Worth, the, uh, the Twin Cities, um, instituted a ban on hydraulic fracturing within the city limits. And, um, and, and of course, uh, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth is an, an oil city. So yeah, that, that's certainly um, a very interesting decision, and one that uh, you know, should be uh, absolutely seminal. Um, the other factor, I would say, having lived in Texas myself, is that uh, a three million dollar uh, compensation for the impact that the industry has had on the Parr family is small change, and the reality is that, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, um, that will disappear in a heartbeat in medical bills if these uh, conditions uh, persist, as they they probably will, and, and so you know, it is a very very far-reaching um, impact now. What we've seen, uh, Vera, is obviously in Australia and now in the UK, we're seeing the blockade and direct action uh, being used more and more to prevent the industry either getting a foothold, as is the case in the UK, or extending its foothold, as is the case in Australia. What, what is occurring in the US? I mean, is it left to individuals such as yourself to, to fight this through the courts? It's uh, right now. I don't see too much blockades. I don't see any of that to speak of. Very little. It's basically citizens exposing the industry, showing what's happening, and warning as many people as possible. As many states that haven't started yet, and countries. We have countries that come and visit us, and we show them what's happening. And it's basically exposure and going to the courts in any kind of lawsuits. If you've been harmed, we have lawsuits all over the country which are showing that people have been harmed and are being harmed. So the blockades that you're doing in Europe and in Australia, I don't really see here at this point to speak of. Well, on the basis that uh, uh, it's estimated that some three quarters of a million wells have been drilled and fracked into unconventional geology in the US over the past 15 years or so. Um, is it perhaps the case that until such time as people are directly impacted themselves, they, they just simply take it, uh, take it for granted? I mean, I, I, saw, I know that uh, one of the statistics is that some 15 million uh, Americans now live within one mile of a fracked well. Yes, that's, that's what I've heard. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, Maybe Americans are just not, they're more complacent. They might be more apathetic than the Europeans and Australians, and they're not willing to um, fight for their freedoms as much. They've, uh, maybe they uh, need to realize that they need to do that, otherwise they're going to lose all their freedoms. So maybe Americans are, are not aware, are willing to do that. As, and what I'm seeing in Europe too, thousands will come out for a protest and uh, that's very difficult to get here. We recently had a rally of some kind, a protest in Washington, D.C., though about a week ago with Native Americans and uh, ranchers came out, landowners, to protest the XL uh, Keystone Pipeline. And they were there for a few days. But uh, that's, you know, so we have maybe two of those a year. And we really need more. We need people to stand up for their rights. They're basically kowtowing to the corporations or they're afraid they're afraid to speak out they're afraid to get publicity they're afraid to be maligned like all of us who do speak out we get maligned regularly and defamed in publications and blogs put out by industry sponsored bloggers like energy in depth is a is a company of bloggers and they're all funded by the industry and they write about us on a regular basis those of us who are the most vocal 
who have the most impact, and they just say the most awful things to discredit us and defame us on a regular basis. They don't just say anything about what we're saying, but they talk about us personally. Oh, I believe you me, I have first-hand experience of that, Vera, uh, after I um, got involved in identifying the root cause of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, and uh, I felt the full wrath of uh, BP's third-party henchmen. Now, um, we've got Dan back on the line from Bentley. So, Dan, uh, can you hear me now again? Yes, I can. Yes. Excellent. Sorry, I, I know that you're you're there in the middle of nowhere, um, and actually we've got a remarkable signal considering that. I don't know how much you caught of uh, the discussion I've just been having with Vera. Uh, Vera was um, uh, a little exasperated, in fact, that uh, you know, what is happening in Australia now and elsewhere in Europe, I, in terms of the blockades, isn't happening in the US, and it's basically left to individual citizens to try and uh, take on the industry. Um, why do you think it is that uh, in, in the U.S. They, there hasn't been any kind of community movement or community organization uh, like we're seeing in Australia and uh, elsewhere in, in Europe now? I think the two main reasons are, you know, very powerful spin control. Uh, the news is totally blanketed and, and getting everyone focused on their pizza and Coca-Cola and television. And it's very difficult to get up when you're a debt slave and, and go out and protest. Also, you know, the, the police state there is, can be pretty brutal. So I think that's, that puts a lot of that uh, type of grassroots activism. It's so large and it's spread over so many fronts. They don't know where to go first. Whereas here there's, there's more focus, uh, especially Northern Rivers. You know, they picked, they picked the wrong place. We've got you know, a very strong indigenous mob here, the Origines, and, you know, they they um, side to side with us here at Bentley, and, you know, we've, we've got a proper camp set up, it's got streets, it's got a six-birth cappuccino machine, you know, we, we're in for the long haul, we ain't going anywhere. But uh, is, is it, uh, is it Magaco, Magasco that um, are trying to get their foot in the ground there? Yeah, that's Met Gasco, but I think there's a few other companies that Santos. There's yeah, Origin. Yeah. So, Origin. but are, are you guys mobile? I mean, the issue here is, are you mobile? Because I mean, the danger is that you know, two and a half, three thousand uh, anti-fracking uh, protectors are nicely corralled there in uh, Bentley. Uh, you know, is there a sort of mobile task force that can get around to the other locations as they try and get their bits in the ground elsewhere? So two, two, two to 3,000 is representative just of the, the mums and pops and kids in this area alone. And so, um, you know, there, there's a, a large force mobilised right across the country. This is just the, the local area. And Ian, this is one of like three actions going on at the moment. We have people down in the Pillager, people in the Laird, um, you know, within a few hundred kilometres of here. There's, there's, I believe, you know, up to 100 people in each of those sites as well. That's fantastic. I mean, to, to maintain these uh, occupations of the sites, uh, I mean, it has to be the way to go because it's very, very clear that there is a global corporatist agenda to, uh, to push this. And, uh, you know, as I've said many times um, in my public presentations, if there was an agenda to poison the global water supply, I actually can't think of a faster way to do it than to railroad this industry in, into pretty much every country across the planet. Yeah, um, I thought what we'd share with you, Ian, is, is if you can see behind me here, there's, um, there's two poles erected, tall poles with, uh, with protectors on the top of each pole, and those poles are tied by like high tension wire. But what that does is they buried up to three meters into the ground, and it enables us to have a presence on top of a tall pole right in the way of where a gas rig would come in. And impossible to move, you know, a pole that size with, with someone camped and locked on on the top of the pole. So, you know, that's been a pretty good strategy of for the guys here, and uh, you know, I thought I'd just tell you some of the the little interesting bits that that we're working on because uh, 
you know, if you haven't got that sort of technology where you are, um, it makes it difficult and the, the police can come in and move people on, whereas that's virtually impossible. Uh, excellent. I mean, that's one of the benefits, of course, of uh, getting in early. Um, you have the yeah. time to, to build those structures. Uh, in the UK to date, uh, it may change, of course. There's always um, new tactics coming on stream. But to date, it has been a case of uh, you know, still trying to raise awareness as opposed to, uh, to totally block, because at the moment, it's still exploratory drilling. Uh, so we, you know, we tend to use the opportunity of the exploratory drilling to raise awareness in the local community. But of course, as and when they come back to start the fracking, then it's a whole new ball game. And at that point, the trucks ain't getting in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you guys are doing a, a hell of a job out there. Thanks. Yeah, Ian. In, a, in addition to the poles down here, we've got a number of tripods you, you can see that there's or you probably can't see from here but there's an angel on top of the tripod um and there's maybe a dozen positions where we've put cement into the ground um and put a lock on in the middle of, a, of the cement called a dragon where we have um where we have people who have chains around their wrists and they lock themselves into the ground um it typically takes a police rescue squad hours to get them out so this is the um, you know, this is some of the 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 um, yeah the block blockading tactics that we've used very very very, um, very effectively here. The Outstanding. Yeah, in in so, the UK in in uh, in Manchester at Barton Moss, the police actually had a designated team that they called the protester removal team to deal with any lock-ons, um, which of course uh, gave rise to how we named ourselves as the investor removal team. So, yeah, so, so what you're seeing now in the background, Ian, is a police car's just arrived and all the protectors slash protesters are waving and gearing them on. And we've also got um, our own drone quadcopter filming all the action. And, um, yeah, it's, it's become a little more sophisticated, our, our front line. And, and, you know, interesting uh, communications as to what's going on and and where and like i said we preparing for a, a small ground confrontation next week where they're sending maybe seven to eight hundred right police to break it up but uh in australia we protected under uh federal law which is for peaceful protests so as long as the protest remains peaceful um our state policemen are uh, underneath that federal law and it's a three-year imprisonment to uh to stop or break that fe breach of that federal law. So, um, you know, there's going to be an obvious uh, agent provocateur to push people into that uh, overline into violence and break a peaceful protest. And so we, we're schooling everyone up here on how important it is not only to maintain a peaceful protest, but also to make sure everyone who's there is known by at least one other person because these agent provocateurs get in and you know pretend to be protesters and and then end up being uh, undercover absolutely and we have we have to watch it exactly the same tactics here in the uk dan we're running out of time but um obviously you guys are right there on the front line it's very important i think that you know we learn from each other's experiences so uh, would you be available to join us uh, next week to give us an update sure uh and if if for some reason i'm not uh, the capable hands of Mike, who's standing here next to me, um, holding the, the iPhone as we re report from the field here. Um, so there'll definitely be uh, a representative, either myself or Mike, which will be there. But I, I endeavour to be there. Fantastic. Well, hey, listen, solidarity from the UK. Uh, we're right behind you. Um, unfortunately, you know, Australia has uh, is I won't say fighting a rearguard action, but uh, you know, you you've. Uh, seen Queensland fracked, not yet quite to oblivion, but they're having a damn good try. And hopefully you're able to prevent these mother frackers from getting their bits in the ground in New South Wales. Absolutely. We, this is, this is our, our last stand. Um, you know, and we, like I said, this community, they picked the wrong bunch. We ain't moving. Excellent stuff. And, um, Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Mike. And um, um, please yeah. pass on our best wishes to everybody at Bentley. And uh, we'll catch with you next week. And we'll let you know how our lawful campaign goes. No, we, I want to talk about that with you next week. 
that that uh, okay. you know is definitely a subject that we want to um, pursue because you know we have some people looking at very similar issues here in the UK. Yeah, this week it's being discussed in Parliament, so fingers crossed. Yeah. Lots of love to everyone in the UK and the US that are that are working on this as well. Good luck, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Mike. Right, Vera, you still with me? Yes. Excellent. So what do you think of that? What do you think of that blockade? Isn't that something else? Yes, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see, and it's wonderful to see that people are doing all that, and they're organized and there's thousands of them and they have all these ideas how to keep uh, locked onto things and and that the police um, maybe are not so brutal over there possibly and that the citizens have rights uh, if, as long as they're peaceful and that uh, the police can't just run roughshod over them so that's all awfully nice to know yeah no i mean it is it is true that australia and the uk at the moment still have uh, at least the um, the remnants of uh, that legislation in place, and as we've demonstrated in the UK, uh, you know, once the police become aware that the protection community knows uh, the law and knows its rights, then you know they they will push the boundaries, but they won't resort to out and out violence, unlike. Unfortunately, the um, the US law enforcement agencies. It it always amuses me that uh, America still refers to itself as the land of the free, which have, mm -hmm. when, of course, it's anything but. But, Vera, listen, I, we've got a video that you have uh, shot in um, some of your uh, forays into uh, Cabot territory. Yeah. So we're, we're going to play out with, uh, with that video. But um, is there any message that you have for the audience in the UK and Australia today? Uh, basically, just don't let them in. Don't let them have a foothold. Do whatever you can, uh, peacefully as much as you can. And um, and you can see that this is going to be right next to your homes, next to your schools, your farms. And they want to take every ounce of gas out. And they will have sites like near us, every quarter of a mile, every half a mile, there are sites, plus all the infrastructure. There'll be endless infrastructure that they don't even tell you about now. All the compressor stations, all the pipelines, all the treatment plants, all the other industries that will come along with this that will use the gases, the different gases, whether it's for plastic or anything else. So this is a massive takeover of your communities and of your country so that the 1% can make some kind of a killing on money and just on the backs of all the people of the world and impact our health to the point where there be less and less of us and much more illness and much more cancer and respiratory illnesses. Well, exactly. And uh, I, you know, the, what is so incredible is that um, uh, the politicians and the industry, they live in a cognitive dissonance, a state of cognitive dissonance. And, and the, the, some of the percentages that we've heard as well, 87% of the communities against fracking. And we're seeing similar percentages in polls in the UK. And I think, you know, we're always going to see a, a, a small number of people, a minority, who really just don't care about the potential risks and uh, just want to push ahead. Uh, I actually gave a public presentation last week in the north of England. Uh, and I was showing some footage of Brian Monk in Queensland actually burning off the methane that had migrated into his water supply. And uh, a member of the audience uh, said that was a setup, that wasn't real. Well, of course, I encouraged him to uh, look at um, some of the footage that Brian Monk has put up on YouTube and uh, where he talks about the impact that the industry has had on his family and particularly his, uh, his young grandson. This is something that uh, we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy, let alone bring into our neighbourhoods. So, Vera, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I, I hope that, uh, well, I'm sure we will have the opportunity to have further discussion. Um, good luck with everything that you're doing in the US. I mean, your work is so important, um, you know, and obviously you're doing something very right for Cabot to be targeting you in the, in the way that you are. So we're going to play out this evening with uh, the video, the full 13-minute video that uh, you've put together from your expeditions into Cabot territory. And for all those people in the UK, let's be inspired by what's going on in Bentley, in New South Wales. The people of New South Wales are determined not to allow the mother frackers to do to their state what they've done across the border in Queensland. And God forbid that those mother frackers get their bits in the ground in the UK. See you next week. Thank you.
it's one water truck after another going through 706 east of Montrose. They're probably fracking up the road. I'm going to go check out the site. There's a sand truck that's the cutout truck there. Across the road. This is all across from homes. Tankers over there, all, that's where they fill up the residual water, residual waste. And the homes are just across from here. This is the Mead site, Mead Farm, M-E-A-D.
nice valley here. You can see a beautiful valley. Then there's a drill rig in the distance up there. Another drill site. You can see it right on the ridge. That's a drill rig. I can't tell what franking company you're using. I'm gonna see if I can get closer to the signs here. There goes the sand truck just leaving. There comes more trucks, dumps of trucks, lots of dust. sand truck coming up the road, leaving the site from Texas, Texas plates in the Texas. I'm here on a neighbor's property across from this site and got permission to videotape and photograph from this her property. Baker Hughes is the uh, fracking company, from what the neighbor told me. She's had her water tested before drilling and then after drilling by the gas company Cabot. Which is good. These are the pumpers pumping trucks.
So all this dust goes into the homes too, you know, that people have to breathe this, who live across the roads and next to them. Like there's homes next door, across the road, and you have to breathe this in, all this particulate matter. These are the hoppers in the back that hold the sand.